On behalf of the Lord and those who've invested in me, thank you. And uh, we've had such a long introduction, we're going to have to just dismiss in prayer now, Pastor. We don't have any other time. Is this the best this will do? Uh, is, this, uh, is this good? Can you hear well with this? Uh, who's working the sound? Who's work? Is that all right? It's okay? In the back? Brother Reno, can you hear? Jose, can you see? <laughs> what a blessing. In fact, it seemed like just yesterday, I was a little boy, I was, I was at the public swimming pool, and, and I saw this little blow-up six-inch kiddie pool. You've seen those things. And I saw this great big old fat boy standing next to that kiddie pool with a little boy named Reno. And Reno was teaching him how to jump into that kiddie pool. Just, just seemed like yesterday I, I drove by and you know how these illustrations just kind of grow and multiply through the years and I still remember that little kiddie pool Brother Reno was jumping inside of and, and that's exciting. In fact, after the service, he challenged me to climb this mountain here and jump into the baptistry. I don't know if I'm going to do that or not, but uh, I love Brother Reno. He is a fun man to hear speak. And fellas, when you, if, if, wow, look at, wow, look at this. Well, you could have danced all night. Uh, anyway, but uh, you fellas that, that do, pre, uh, in fact, Brother Caleb, our pulpit moves naturally because all the earthquakes. And, and so, you know, you just kind of have to kind of just go with the flow there in California. But if you fellas do surrender to preach, make sure when you preach, you're interesting and you keep people's attention. Brother Reno is just a wonderful example of that. And uh, he's Mr. Youth Worker. If you're going to be in youth work, you ought to spend time with him. Uh, successful youth group, started a camp, started a teen conference. I've been at all of those places, written books, taught in colleges, uh, youth work. And thank you just publicly, all you pastors and youth workers, for investing in the next generation. We guys are fading out. We don't have long, in fact, Brother Wells, I'd be shocked if he's alive maybe six more months, but some of us are getting older, but we're sure needing you young guys. You know, when the youth directors stand up and they need a cane and they need oxygen just to introduce themselves, we need the next generation, and we do. And I thank the Lord for those of you that have invested many, many, many years. And obviously, I do love Brother Wells. Um, uh, he, is, he is probably the most uh, kind gentleman pastor I've ever met. Just, 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 just kind. Uh, he's a gentleman. He's got the southern hospitality. And when you travel with people, the real person comes out. I have never heard him say a shady word. I've never uh, seen, him, seen him look at something or someone he shouldn't. Uh, he's the same way away from here as he is here. And that's how we're all supposed to be. And uh, the heart of an evangelist, somehow he's, he's still trying to reach the mission field, and trying to pastor and trying to get this college going and now the youth conference, just, just so many things. And your pastor's just as important. So young people, I hope that one decision will take place when you leave here, you'll go back home, love your pastor more. And you'll be very thankful to these who've given a week out of their life uh, to come to this conference with you. Just the invitation is kind of like we're already on Thursday night. You know, we're already ahead of the game. Uh, usually Monday night's kind of hard, and Tuesday night's a little bit easier, and then it kind of breaks loose, but, but a very great spirit already tonight. Now, several things have changed since I was here last year. Uh, I had a total knee replacement so I won't be diving off the pulpit doing gainers and backflips and probably won't be running down the aisle. Um, you say, why did I have knee surgery? Because I heard you get pain drugs. And when you have surgery, they give you painkillers. Look, someone's going to get some right now. And uh, <laughs> see, being my height my whole life, I've never been high. <laughs> so I just figured... Legally, I could be high for once. Say, so why would someone have a knee surgery? In fact, a total knee replacement, what it is, they cut two inches off your tibia, two inches off your fibia. In other words, it's like amputating your leg. They pull the knee out, screw screws into one part of the bone, the other, and then you have a fake knee. 
and then you're elevating it, uh, putting ice on it for three weeks. You're in a walker, then a cane, and a wheelchair for a while. And so I went through all those things. You say, why would you do something like that? Here it is. I go into the doctor, and uh, I'm there at the surgery room, and a lady says, put this on. If you've ever seen those hospital gowns, it's like, here, here's some fig leaves like Adam and Eve had. Here, put this on. And so a stranger, a stranger, a woman is saying, take off all your clothes, put this on. I don't even know who you are. So I'm putting this robe on and they say, sit on the edge of this bench. We're going to stick a needle in your back and give you a spinal tap. I said, I thought that's what women had when they had babies. They said, well, you're getting a spinal tap. We're numbing you from the waist down. And then a lady said, uh, all right, so uh, prop your leg up. I said, now what? She said, I'm shaving your leg. I said, no woman has ever shaved my leg before, much less someone. I don't even know who you are. She's shaving my leg, and next thing I know, they're wheeling me down the hall, and they're going to cut my leg. I never saw the doctor. I never saw him. All I know is I woke up in a lot of pain. Later on, he said, but I saw you. Guess what my surgeon's name was, Brother Caleb? Guess. You'll never guess. Orthopedic surgery, Dr. Saw. <laughs> and that's a true story. That's his name, Dr. Uh, 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 uh. That was his last name. Now, why would someone have surgery like that? Here's why. And he said, you're not getting any younger, and it's not getting any better. You have no cartilage. He said, too much soul winning. That was it. Just too much soul winning through the years. Just wore the knee out. So I don't know if I'm supposed to uh, sue my pastor or our deacon's board or those that wrote the Great Commission. Or, you know, I'm not sure who I'm supposed to sue. But here it is. I had to make a decision. Was the pain and discomfort for a while going to be worth the long-range function of my knee. Same thing at a youth conference like this. Some of the decisions you make will be painful. It may be breaking up a relationship, dropping a friend, unfriending someone. It may be just getting rid of your social media altogether. It may be something as painful as at night saying, Mom and Dad, Here's my phone so you can scroll through it, see everything that's going on. I don't need a phone while I'm in bed. I don't need to be texting people or sending pictures back and forth. It may be something painful like that. It may be something painful like going to a youth pastor or a pastor or a youth director's wife and confessing up and saying, you know, I've never told anybody this, but I need to come clean about something. Sometimes those things are painful, but when you look at 50 and 60 great years of life, it's worth it. It's just worth it. And so that's, that's the introduction here tonight. We're in the book of Proverbs, chapter number one. This is not a teen message. I wish it was. I preached all my teen messages here. And so now I've got something a little bit new. On the book table, just quickly here, a little advertisement. Others will. Uh, the Soul Winning New Testament, 100 pages of soul winning helps and how-tos and the cults and what's wrong with them in the back of the Bible. There's that. One step at a time, 686 pages of doctrinal text. It's in Spanish. It's in English both. No copyright. You can print it. You can sell it. You can give it away. People use these as midweek Bible study sermons, mission fields, jail services, Sunday school lessons. There is that. Life is worth living. Bible perspective on suicide. I don't know how many of these have been sold now. Tremendous lessons. Every teenager ought to read this, meditate on it, because you know people that are either doing it or have thought about doing it. I've been, I have done many a suicide funeral. It's the most selfish thing anyone can ever do is to take their life. Puts everyone on a guilt trip forever. And it's something you don't want to do. I'm not spending a whole message on it, but in a crowd this size, there's someone this year in this room that has heard the lie, hopefully you didn't believe it, but you've heard the lie, they would be better off without you. You have failed. You can never get away from this. They'll never let you forget that you're a failure. And you know who that voice is coming from? Down here. It's a lie of Satan. 
just a lie of Satan. But that book is available. Soul Winning the Heart of God. If you've never won a soul to Christ, just a lot of how-tos. If, uh, if you think you may be married one day, I still do. Uh, some of you guys need to buy the book. I hope they do. But uh, this one is Once You're Married, I Still Do. And then this one is Look What God Did For Me. I was at an airport years ago, and I got a phone call from a Bible college student, and he said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He said, is it worth serving God? No one had ever asked me that question, and it was a freshman in Bible college, Brother Caleb. And I said, well, sure it's worth serving God. What am I going to say? No, don't do it. Don't do it. Don't surrender. Go back to your seat. And I said, why do you ask? He said, well, I don't like the rules at Bible college, and before I finish four years, I just need to know in advance, is it worth it? And so the Lord smoked my heart, and I put 50, 51 stories of just cool things that God did for me. 430 pictures. This is a guy's book. <laughs> One of our men, you'll love this pastor. He said, Pastor, I got that book you wrote, read it in two nights. You know, it's like a 10-minute read. But two, he is so proud of himself. I finished it. And so, like catching a blue marlin, like shooting a brown bear, like holding the Super Bowl trophy, like talking to a Super Bowl coach on the telephone, interviewing a coach of the NFL in his office. I mean, just so many things. You know what? You sell out to the Lord. God's got some wonderful spoiling that he wants to do for you. God has no favorites. You find anyone that served the Lord very long, and it's like, let me tell you something I got to do. And it's all because they fell in love with the Lord. Never feel guilty when your heavenly father spoils you because you're his favorite. And then here's this just came out, and it's, uh, it's called Winning With Your Kids. It's just on child rearing, some child rearing tips, birth to sixth grade. I mean, it deals with how to name a child, how to stick them in the nursery the first week. Oh, look, little Abigail's crawling in right now. Welcome. Good. Come on in. Come on in. Just got born a couple hours ago. She's here. And, and, no, she's not. Don't look. And uh, <laughs> so here's that there too. This book as being a simple-minded teenager. That's what this is. And so uh, called to preach. You preach your boys. Like the pastor said, you're not going to be a preacher. You're already one. Right. So it just helps sermon outlines, a whole chapter on how to get places to preach when you're a teenager and so forth. Look, someone's surrendering already. Look at this. God is moving. You want this too? Man, you are so organized. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're in Proverbs chapter one. I hope you don't, I haven't got 15 other things to say, but we better get into the message here. Who rode on a bus here? Rode on a bus? A van? Cars? Who's ridden on a church bus at some time? At some time, ridden on a church bus. Here's my bus story, real fast. I have to hurry. I have to hurry. So here it is. Marla Varna falls asleep. The bus is full of people. The purse dumps out. And uh, about that time, uh, Bill Heinemann hands her her ink pen. Well, it's a tear gas ink pen. So when she grabs it, pow, tear gas all in the bus. And the bus driver couldn't see. And now we're almost going off the Mississippi Bridge. He pulls over. Kids are pulling the emergency door, diving out the back of the bus. Next year on the rules, no tear gas. <laughs> the next year, we have five flats on the way to youth conference. Five flat tires. $1,000 we spent on tires before we ever got there. So the next year, I said, we're going to beat that. We're going to bring our own spare tire. And we did. We tied it to the roof of the bus. We stuck it on the roof, had ropes coming in the middle of the bus, tied it on there. It looked like a bus with a big lifesaver on the middle. It looked like Beverly Hillbillies. We went under an underpass, and somehow the height limit was not right. As we swooped under the underpass, the underpass hit our tire, popped those ropes, and that big tire went going down the highway. It's a miracle someone was not killed. Then about that time, we went to camp. We had a girl by the name of Lisa that uh, slept next to the stick shift next to the uh, bus driver. And I was, I was in the luggage rack up here. And uh, Lisa, Lisa got sick. She did not ask permission. She did not raise her hand. She got sick to her stomach. She began throwing up. And her life's verse was, Whatsoever thy stomach findeth to do, do it with thy might. 
And she began throwing up. It seemed like gallons and gallons and gallons all over the floor of the bus. Well, about that time, we headed into Texas, and it was a reduced speed limit, 50, 40, 30, 20. And so we went slower, slower, slower. Then those flashing red lights, and the bus stopped. There's something called law of inertia. When it stopped, it leaned back. It began flowing down the aisle. It looked like Mount Vesuvius had exploded and the lava was flowing toward Pompeii. Well, poor old Jeff, an eighth grader in our youth group, was sound asleep in the back of the bus and his head was right in the middle of the aisle. And what Lisa contributed to the floor engulfed Jeff's face like an amoeba eating its food under a microscope and... Then Jeff said, ooh, what is this? And they turned the light on, and that was a mistake. And many people joined Lisa's activity, and that was it. And so thank the Lord for buses. We just love the bus ministry, don't we? Proverbs chapter 1, let's look here. We'll look at two verses, if you will, and then we have to get going here. Proverbs chapter 1, verse number 7, the Bible says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Notice the phrase, the fear of the Lord. That word fear is not the word we would think of being afraid. It translates more, it translates more to the, the thought of respect. 300 times it is mentioned in the Bible, respect the Lord or fear the Lord. Then one of the passage over in Genesis, if you will, Genesis chapter number 7 for a moment. Genesis chapter number 7, and here we are. Genesis 7, you know the story. Uh, Adam and Eve built the ark. and No, no, excuse me, a different, different Bible. Uh, Noah has been working 100 years on the ark, and it's implied that his sons probably helped him, Shem, Ham, Japheth. So Genesis 7, 7, and Noah went in, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark. You say, well, what's so big a deal about that? We'll talk about that in just a moment. He went in, his wife went in, his sons and their wives went into the ark. I want to speak on one, one word tonight, just, uh, just quick as I can get it done. Respect. Respect. Let's say the word together. You ready? One, two, three. Respect. Let's pray. Father, bless this time we have in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was in high school, I got saved when I was in seventh grade. Went soul winning for the first time, I believe, when I was in ninth grade. I felt like my heart caught on fire at a camp and a conference in the 10th grade. I went to public high school, Astruma High. So that summer, I decided I would be carrying my Bible to school. I'd have gospel tracts. I was going to witness. I was going to be unashamed. That's a hard thing to do if you're by yourself. But if you have the Lord, it's a majority. And so I remember carrying my tracts to school, passing out tracts, witnessing in class. Anytime opportunity uh, availed itself, held up my hand, put in the Lord, witnessed to the high school principal, witnessed to the band teacher, uh, won, won many classmates to the Lord, made a prayer list. But oftentimes I was mocked. I'd be going down the hall and I'd hear, Billy Graham, right here, the Paul, Jesus. I'd hear things like that. My locker sometimes was spit upon. Uh, sometimes there'd be a Playboy magazine stuck in my locker. One time I opened up a, I opened up a, a, a dictionary and they had a big marijuana joint there and written on it, property of Reno Likens. But it was just right, anyway, that was a marijuana joint. And so at the end of the year, someone grabbed my yearbook and signed it. Here's what they said. They said, we laughed at you. We mocked you. But you were the most respected student in our high school. We wish we had the courage that you had. Amen. You know, I wouldn't take anything for that. I wouldn't take anything for it. Girls, let me say this to you. One of the greatest desires a man has is to be respected. Admiration would be another word. Regard, respect, honor. 
And God commands us to have that for him. How come? Well, he deserves it. God is in a class of all his own, all powerful, all knowledgeable, uh, all present, uh, all seeing. Uh, He's uh, self-sufficient. He's the creator, all existent. He wrote the Bible. He's the same. He's not moody. He lived a perfect life, uh, died, rose from the dead. Anyone that rises from the dead on their own power demands respect. But we desire it. Sometimes if a man does not get respect, anger comes. It was Nebuchadnezzar when the Hebrew children did not bow to him. He got so angry he threw them in the fiery furnace. It was Haman when Mordecai did not bow. He said, we're building the gallows and we're going to kill you. It was when Herod gave a great speech and did not give respect or glory to God. God killed him and had him eaten with worms. The Bible says in the New Testament, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. So one day, those who have not respected God here, one day they will. One day they will kneel. They will say, you are the Savior. We were wrong. You were right. And he'll get the respect that he deserves and always has. Respect must be taught to our children. If you're an adult here today, you have to teach it. It does not come natural. Uh, We need to uh, be teaching our generation respect for the elderly. Uh, Getting the door for them. Helping them in. Uh, They're a little bit wobbly. Some of our senior citizens, helping them to their seat. uh, Carrying packages for them. Uh, uh, My dad taught me always respect veterans. A man's got a veteran's hat on or a man's in uniform. Thank him for serving our country and thank him for keeping our country free. Uh, We have to respect the judge. Uh, When the judge enters the room, the bailiff says, All rise. Uh, You don't get a choice. If you're in that courtroom, all rise. The judge just came in. So there's, there's respect there. Uh, when our flag is, is raised and the national anthem is sung, there ought to be respect there. And I, I'm still, I, I'm not rude, but if I'm around someone who forgot to stand, I kind of thump them on the head and say, you forgot to stand. Hey, we're, hey, we're all, hey, we're all, hey. Uh, anyway, and uh, it's got to be taught to our kids. Timothy was told by Paul how to behave themselves in the house of God. We ought to respect God's house. We ought to respect God's book. Brother Tim Rule, my good friend, if you ever put anything on top of your Bible, you owe him a dollar. He said, it's God's word. We don't put anything on top of it. We don't put our notes. We don't put our song, but we don't put anything on top of God's word. You owe me some money. So sometimes I'll just mess with him. Anyway, I'm not going to tell you what I do. Respect is easy to lose. Job's wife is respected until she says, why don't you curse God and die? Then we lose respect for her. It was Nabal, Abigail's husband. She said his name means fool and so is he. She had lost respect for him. Lot tried to get his sons and his, uh, excuse me, his daughters out of Sodom before it was destroyed. He said, God's going to destroy it. And they laughed at him. Uh, they had lost respect. Eli's son, Hophni and Phinehas, uh, because uh, he was overweight and he uh, lacked self-control, uh, they did not listen to their father. We need to respect property, respect God's men, respect God's book, uh, uh, respect God's plan for our lives. Now, I want to say this. Sin will always cause you to lose respect for yourself. Amen. I wonder how Rahab the harlot felt about her self-esteem. I wonder how Mary Magdalene, who at one time had seven devils inside of her. By the way, girls, let me encourage you. Most girls just have five, but she had seven. She was real. Anyway, okay, never mind. Man, there's no place to hide behind this pulpit. And so why did you read this part about Noah? Well, here it is. The miracle about Noah was not that they finished the ark. The miracle is after working a hundred years with their father, all three boys decided, I'm getting on too. I'm getting on with dad and his wife. Hey, honey, what are we doing for vacation? Working on the ark. What are you doing today? Working a hundred years. He got on. She said, I'm on too. Shem, Ham, Japheth were on. Their wives were on. How come? They had respect for him. If you're ever going to lead, you're going to have to have respect. If you're ever going to do anything for God, you're going to have to have respect. Years ago, there was a teacher in public school. His name was E.B. Burns, Edwin Burns. I'll never forget. They were, they were mixing the schools in and all the different races in Louisiana at that time. And, 
And uh, Mr. Burns just, just had a tough time with it. Mr. Burns had an anger issue. And in public school, I'm sorry to say, we were not there to learn. We were there to torment the teachers. That was our spiritual gift. And we eighth graders had Louisiana history. We had to learn the different floats in Mardi Gras. We had to learn the different beers that the priests drank. You know, the different nickel beers at the fair. It it was nuts. Uh, We didn't learn a lot of history. But I remember this. Would always push Mr. Burns' buttons. He'd say, Ray. He'd call Roe. My last name, my friend would answer, Here, Jones. I'd say, Here, you're not Jones, you're Ray. And you're not Ray, you're Jones. Man, his temperature just start rising. And then pretty soon, Mr. Burns, how come George Washington had wooden teeth? We'd ask him all these dumb questions. He'd just get so mad. One time, he got so angry, he stepped on the chair, stood on his desk, and just started cursing us. You blankety-blank kids, I hate you. I hate this school. Then ding, the bell rang. We left, hey, high five the next class. Hey, we got him on his desk. See what you can do. I mean, it was just Trump that. It, it was just unbelievable. One day he looked at me, he says, Ray, I'm calling your father and telling him how you're messing up this class. I said, sure. I went home that night. I kid you not, landline, no cell phone. The phone rang. I picked it up. Hello, Ray residents. Could I speak to Mr. Tom Ray? It was Mr. Burns. I wasn't quick enough to say, he died 20 years ago. It, 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 it's too late. My dad, who is I said, it's for you. My dad says, this is Tom Ray. Uh-huh. 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 I'll take care of it. Da-da. Da-da. <laughs> he took care of it that night. The next day, Mr. Burns, how may I serve you? I love your class. Would you like me to call the roll? I know who the students are. How? He never got another problem out of me. How come? He followed through. And he got a little respect from me. Quickly, how do you get respect? You say, well, I want to be respected. Respect is not demanded. It's earned. Doesn't matter how rich you are. Doesn't matter what your title is. Doesn't matter what your job is. You can have more respect and be at the bottom of the totem pole than the owner of the company. So what can you do? And we must hasten. Number one, be a hard worker. Even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be true and whether it be right. (coughs) Excuse me. Be a hard worker. Be the one that shows up early and stays late. Be the one that finishes the job. When the pastor says, we're having a work day, show up at that thing. Be the hard worker. Number two, don't be a gossip. Don't be the person that talks about someone behind their back and you say one thing one way and you say something else here or you text them this and text everyone else that. Be careful not to be a gossip. Number three, keep your promises. Let God be true and every man a liar. God's promises are always true. That's why we respect him. Always tells the truth. Years ago, my son Jonathan, what a name, huh? You like that? Jonathan said, Dad, it's my birthday this week, and you said you'd take me out to a restaurant. I said, okay, just remind me, son. I got in late that night. It must have been 8 o'clock on a Friday night. I said, all right, Jonathan, where do you want to go? He said, claim jumpers. Friday night, it's an hour away, two-hour wait. We're going to get our food at 11 o'clock at night. We're going to get our food at 11. I said, claim jumpers? Dad, you said. I said, all right. Push me through the door. And we went. I thought I was going to drown in my soup when we said, dear Lord, and I fell asleep in my soup. (laughs) Did you enjoy it? No. (laughs) Why would you go? I made a promise. Keeping my words more important than having some rest. That's why it's important when we make a vow at an altar or we make a promise that we keep our word. It's important, young people, when you get married and say, till death do you part, you really mean it. You want to have respect? Keep your promise. Number next, be consistent. Jesus Christ, the same 
yesterday, today, forever. You had a youth conference, rah, 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 we're excited about the Lord. How about on Monday? How about on Tuesday? Just consistent. Some people are on fire for the Lord this week and the fire's gone out. You just want to be consistent. Number next, dress sharp. Amen. You say, Pastor, this is just like a list or something. I'll I, I, I wind it up in just a minute. Exodus 22, 8, about the high priest and the priest, the Levites, it said, their clothes were to be for beauty and glory. Let me just say this. We live in a day where people dress down, especially California. Someone died, your grandmother dies, so you come in shorts, halter top, and flip-flops, and you look at your grandmother. That's not how it's supposed to be. Amen. We dress down up for a big occasion. You have an appointment with the president, you dress up. You have an appointment with the boss, you dress up. You go to church, you dress up. We're not all about clothes, but you ought to look the best with what you have. It's just something about it. When the dress code got kicked out of our public school and they could wear anything they wanted to, look what's happened. Number next, have self-control. The Bible says the hero is the man who that can control his spirit is the greater hero than the man that taketh the city. What's he saying? Control your mouth. Well, I just couldn't help it. Control your spinning. Control your eyes. Con control your temper. You just want to be a person under control. We're hastening quickly. Show courage. Brother Reno preached about David killing the giant tonight. He showed courage. He went from 17-year-old boy to the general over the armies in one hour. <laughs> he showed courage. I still, still remember I was probably eight years of age. My dad's in heaven now. He's been there four months, having a great time. We were at a table. Is my mom and my dad and my brother and I. Who's got one brother too many? Slip your hand up real quick. Look at all these decisions. You got one too many. Stark dropped them in the wrong, wrong house. Okay, look, 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 your siblings wiping tears right now. So anyway, we're at this table, and I did not know all the cuss words. I was eight years of age. I didn't know all the cuss words. I hadn't been around some of the youth pastors here. <laughs> but we're sitting at the table, and we're eating. My dad gets up. It is a group of four men at the table next to us. I said, where are you going? And he walked over to their table and said, hey, fellas, I don't appreciate the words you're using. My little family's over here. I wish you'd stop it. My dad's a booming five foot four. You say, what were you thinking? I was thinking, my dad's about to get whipped. Dad and four men. He walked back to the table. I mean, it was quiet. There's only two tables of people in the whole restaurant, us and them. And dad just chewed them out. We sat down. We're eating in silence. Pretty soon they're laughing. They're getting a little bit louder. Dad leaves the seat. Fellas, did you understand what I said? I meant it. No more cussing. You know what happened at that table? What happened next? My dad grew to 10 feet high. When he came back to that table, I said, I got a man for a dad. I got someone who's got some courage. That happened 53 years ago. I still remember it. You know, it takes courage to live for the Lord. Sometimes people say, oh, you're a Christian. You're just a sissy. I still remember I was in high school one time carrying my Bible in class, and someone says, hey, a Bible, you sissy. I said, really? You carry it to your next class. See how you do. Come on now. See if you can carry it to your next class. Let's shut them up. <laughs> it takes courage to live for the Lord. My wife was on the plane recently, and well, about two years ago. I said, make sure you have your tracks. Now, I've always got my tracks. I said, you're flying out of San Jose. It's probably going to be a professional football player on that plane. She said, I'll be watching. She texted me about five minutes later. Guess who I'm sitting behind? I said, who? Jerry Rice, the Hall of Famer. I tried to sit by him, but he said the seat was taken. As soon as he got off the plane, help me, Lord. She walked up to Jerry Rice with the gospel track, and he was surrounded taking pictures with people. 
Just want to give you this and ask you to read it. My wife, she called me. She said, I took all the courage I had. Praise the Lord for women soul winners, girls soul winners who have a little courage to pass out a track and give out a witness. It's not always easy taking a stand. I was in the airport and I saw these, these three old men. I thought it was you guys. And, uh, but these three old men, one of them, I kid you not, he looked like Mick Jagger. Mick Jagger was a rock and roller when I was a kid. Now I'm almost 61 and the guy's still alive. I think he shoots up formaldehyde or he's got a mortician or something that keeps him alive. Well, it looked like him. It wasn't, but it was him and two old men with a guitar. I said, they're old rock and rollers. I didn't know who they were, Simon and, Simon and Hillary or something like that, or maybe Gar, uh, anyway, Garth, uh, Elvis, something, Michael. Anyway, it, they just looked like they were somebody. It took me a couple minutes. I finally just walked up and I said, I ought to know who you are. I'm sure you're famous. <laughs> who are you? <laughs> well, we're in this such and such. I'd never even heard of the group. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and gave him a try. Here's what he said, Brother Caleb. You know, these rock and roll. I saved when I was 16. I said, are you kidding me? You want respect? Have courage. Quickly. Have a victory. Have a victory. Whip drugs. Whip your temper. Whip alcohol. Whip some problem. Win your first soul. Read the Bible from cover to cover. Have some victory where you can say, guess what I did? Finish the whole Bible. Hey, I won my first soul. We have a girl in our youth group. Her name's Deja. She has a twin named Dana. Her mother has battled drugs her whole life. Her dad passed away two years ago. Her grandmother's raising her. She was on the soul winning bus the other night. She said, Pastor, I got to win seven souls tonight to the Lord. She just won her first soul like two weeks ago. She's been going and going and going and going for, for years. She's just so shy, but she had a victory. It gives you respect quickly. What else? Go through a trial. You know, it's an interesting thing. If you read the story of Job, when Job buried his children and should have buried his wife, and uh, no, no, you have to read the whole thing, but he probably felt like it, but Buried his children. He's got boils all over him. And she didn't say, come here, big boy. She said, come here, big boil. And uh, <laughs> so here's Job. He's got all these problems. Said his three friends, you remember? At least they came. They'd have been heroes if they'd have just kept their mouth shut. But they came. They wept. They sat. They didn't say anything for seven days. And the Bible said they just sat down and watched him. Sounds like another passage in the Bible. And they crucified Jesus. And the multitude sat down and watched him there. You know what gets people's attention? When God allows a trial into your life. They're watching. To see if you respond differently than they would. Sometimes we say, well, well, why am I going through this? It may be God's gathering a crowd of people you never could reach in the good times. But God sends you through the, uh, 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 the valley of the shadow of death or some trial and parents are split up or you bury someone and they're just watching to see if you make it. Think of three of our young people when I was youth pastor in Baton Rouge. The dad had had a head injury. He had fallen at work and never was quite right, their dad. Embarrassed him at teen activities. We'd have a teen activity. He'd jump behind the pulpit and just start preaching to everybody. It was like, really? He just wasn't all there. The news that comes on, couple has struggled. Gun goes off. Husband dead, wife in custody. Three boys in our teen group. I rushed to the house. They had just taken away their dad who was dead. 
They had just handcuffed the mother and took her away in the squad car. And those three boys were sitting on the couch. Yet it just happened in their kitchen. Just happened. The gun went off. I just sat there. They said, we're going to be okay, Brother Mike. Said, you're going to be fine. All three of those boys graduated from Bible college, went into the ministry. Let me just say to you young people, you're going to be fine. Because he's not going to let you go through it alone. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Dad may leave you. Mama may leave you. Brother may leave you. Friends may. He says, I will never leave you. But there's a crowd of people that's watching and they're saying, all right, they're going to crack up now. They're not going to make it. And if you get through that thing, they're going to say, we want to know about your God. You've got something that we don't have. Amen. How do you get respect? You go through a trial. We watched John Wilkerson go through his. His son went to a ball game, freak accident. The car rolled over. Everyone was okay. They looked in the back seat. His son Tyler was dead. 17, surrendered to preach. A young preacher boy. Pure as could be. God just took him home. Must have been 2,000 people at the funeral. I went. They shot the picture of the family up on the screen. One at a time, each kid, their silhouette was highlighted. Tyler... I'm going to miss you. Thanks for all the ice cream you brought us from Baskin and Robbins. Tyler, I'm going to miss the talks we had late at night. I love you. I can't wait to see you in heaven. Tyler, we're so proud of you. Mom and Dad loved you so much. People were sobbing. Then John and Linda Wilkerson walked out, hand in hand, Mom and Dad. He put his arm around her waist and they sang at their son's funeral. You know what we were doing? We were watching. We were watching. When I left, I said, we have a mighty big God. Oh, we've got a big God. Wow. Hmm. Pets the pirate lost his eye to cancer. We were watching. His son had mental issues jumped off a building and ended his life. We were watching. Hey, get respect. You go not to the trial, you go through it. Young people, there's life after the trial. So I'm in the seventh grade. My dad was rarely home and we didn't realize he had a dark side. He was always chasing money and... Missed Christmases, missed hurricanes. He'd be gone three months at a time. He was not abusive to us, but he drank a lot, carried a gun. So one night he didn't come home. We turned on the news. He's handcuffed on the news. And it's in all the channels nationwide and the newspaper. He's been caught in the mafia. The counterfeiting, friends with murderers and hitmen. Bank robberies. The next morning, the FBI towed our only car off. Our pastor came to the house. We were crying. My dad was in the New Orleans federal pen. They were holding him there. As we cried, we said, Brother Smith, we going to be okay? He said, you're going to be fine, boys. God's going to take care of you. He'll get you through it. It's not forever. The sun's coming up in the morning. The valley ends and it's a mountaintop on the other side. There's some wonderful days ahead. The teenage year, I had some tough teenage years, had some sorrowful times, but know what God was doing? God was working on my heart because he knew one day I was going to be a pastor in California and about 90% of our youth group, no dad in the home so one day I could say, hey, I've been there a little bit. I understand a little bit. If I make it, you make it too. Yeah. Better for a young person to hurt a little bit as a young person and comfort thousands later than you never hurt and never comfort anybody. How do you get respect? You go through the trial. 
Quickly, apologize when needed. <laughs> apologize when needed. You say, now wait a minute. If I apologize and admit I'm wrong, aren't people going to look down on me? No, they're going to look up to you. Now, I don't know if your church has a baseball league. We do not. Our men are not sanctified enough <laughs> to play other churches. Can you imagine? Go, 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 go. After the game, loser, loser. Your church is a bunch of losers. The church of Jesus Christ, you're a loser. You know, that just doesn't go over well. Strike him out. Tag him. Kill him. <laughs> you know, men kind of get riled up. We're competitive. So we don't play other churches. Once a year, we have a Memorial Day picnic. It's choose up team. Adults, we're going to play a game. And I always give the speech. And years ago, I gave this speech. I said, men, we're not pro. Some of the guys playing today are in their 80s. <laughs> give them a break. They play once a year. This is not real. <laughs> so if you play for a real team, lighten up on us. This is for fun. We are fundamentalists. Fun. So here's one of our men. It's a miracle. He hits the ball. It looks like a bunt, and he's running. <laughs> one of the men who thinks he's a pro picks it up. 9,000 miles an hour. <laughs> he said, he's out. A couple minutes later, he gets to the base. I said, it's close enough. <laughs> I said, let's let him be safe. No, pastor, he's out. I threw him out. I said, look, man, that's the first time Brother Baker's ever hit the ball in his life. Look, let him be safe. He's out. I said, no, let's let him be safe. He is out. Pastor, he's out. That's what's wrong with our church. You guys don't even know the rules. I hate this. He threw a fit, took his glove, threw it down, got in his pickup truck, Peel out. That afternoon, he calls me on the phone. Pastor. I said, yes. This brother so-and-so. Oh, the guy that made a fool out of himself in front of the whole church? Is that, is that who's on the phone? Well, pastor, he was out. Does it matter, brother? <laughs> Bigger than that is you lost your testimony in front of the whole church if you even had one to start with. What should I do? I said, I'm not going to make you do anything. But if you want any respect, you'll stand up Sunday publicly, confess your pride and your sin, and beg them to forgive you. You don't have to. You just will remain with no respect. You know, sometimes you may have to make an apology So quickly, I'm youth pastor. It's my first year. I felt a little intimidated by some youth workers I inherited. I was 21. Some of them were 50. Every time I teach the young people, it looked like they were saying, that ain't the way it was in Abraham Lincoln's day. <laughs> so I prayed about it, prayed about it for about two seconds and fired them. Now, how do you fire a Sunday school teacher who didn't do anything wrong? It's like this. The Lord has led us. We are resolving this class. We do not need this class anymore. So that was it. Let them go. Not long after that, they moved to another state. I was asked to speak at a youth conference at that church. As soon as I got the phone call, Brother Reno, the Holy Spirit said, hey, that couple that you didn't know how to lead and you abruptly let go, you owe them an apology. I said, who is saying this? <laughs> it's the Holy Spirit. I said, I promise when I first see them, I'll tell them. I stood up to speak. I got there late, got ready to speak, and I spotted them in the back. Finished the whole message. 
As soon as church was out, I made a beeline to them. I came all the way up to them. I said, man, it's good to see you. And they smiled. They were cordial. They said, boy, it's good to see you. I said, I need to ask you something. By the way, when you make a real apology, you don't say, well, you did and you did. and You know, maybe. No, no, no. Eat the crow. I said, when I first came to our church, I was young and inexperienced. And I asked you not to teach anymore. I'm sorry. I started crying. Would you forgive me? Here's what they said. We've never been fired for serving God before. <laughs> they still remembered. I said, I'm sorry. Got the sweetest letter in the mail the next week. It's addressed to me. and It said, we had just about lost all respect for Christianity until last week. When you spoke to us and apologized, it restored our faith in Christianity and leadership. Thank you for being honest and transparent. Whew. Hey, fellas, let me say this. When you get married, you're going to be saying, I'm sorry, a lot. <laughs> and you know what your wife's going to say? I know, you are. <laughs> if you can't say it now, don't get married. You're not going to resolve anything. How to get respect quickly, when souls... It's just like one preacher said, the decent thing to do. Amen. Knocked on the door this week. Lady answered the door. She hugged me. Can you imagine that? I mean, she just opened the door and just hugged me. I said, okay. She said, I used to come to the church years ago. I got baptized at your church. I said, good to see you. She's married now. Ten-year-old son. He got saved right there in front of her. Husband's police officer. They all came Sunday. It's nothing like that. Pulled up to a house this week. Great big old fella. I don't know if it was John or Big John, the guy that you discipled, Brother Reno, the guy that you pushed in front of the bus or whatever it was that you did to him. And I mean, he pushed off a cliff. Well, anyway, he must have backslid or something because he's standing in front of this house. I said, hey, I pulled up to catch these people. He said, they're not home. I said, who are you? He said, I'm their friend. And I just said, so how's life treating you? And I'd never met the guy. He just started crying. He said, it's going terrible. He said, I got four kids. I'm living with a friend. I don't have a place to stay. And I never say things like this. I looked at him, Pastor, and I said, what is your drug of choice? He hadn't even told me he was on drugs. I just looked at him and figured he was. What is your drug of choice? He said, I'm hooked on speed. I said, it's hot out here. How about we sit in my car? See, we did a drive-by. He got in my car, cranked it up, turned the air on. Would you like to hear how to go to heaven? I would. I've never had this ever happen. I said, well, right here. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm thinking, he's a big guy. Maybe he's got that sleep apnea or something like that, and you don't have the little CPAP machine or whatever they call that thing. And so I said, and the next verse is right here. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, and for the wages of sinners, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think he was coming off of drugs or going up on drugs. You'd have to ask Brother Reno. He knows all those, those uh, things that youth directors do. But uh, so finally I just think, well, you know, he's got to be awake. I said, and the next thing, and I slapped his hand, and the next verse is right here. Yeah, right here. And the next thing is right here. And the next thing is right here. He was awake. And he got saved. There's nothing like winning a soul to Christ. Amen. Nothing like it. We got to get out of here or no one's going to respect me <laughs> keeping you here this long. How do you get respect? You serve the Lord a long time. A long time. A long time. What do you mean a long time? Daniel, it said, serve the Lord continually. No break. He just served him through his youth, his adult life, and all the way to the end. He finished. And then last, 
If you want respect, you have to do the hard thing. Sometimes the hard thing is to walk an aisle and surrender to preach. I still remember when I surrendered to preach. I've not always been the height that I am now. At one time, I was short. <laughs> Three foot six, first grade. First time I ever heard someone say, there's a midget on the campus. There's a midget. And I kept looking, where, 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 where? And they found out they were pointing at me. About that time, I fell off my bicycle, chipped my teeth. Now it looked like I was a vampire, so a midget vampire. <laughs> had flat feet, and they had put corrective shoes on me. Then you could hear me walking down the street, fat-footed uh, vampire. My asthma kicked up, had asthma. Got black glasses, looked like a fly when I blinked. So looked like a professor, fly flat-footed, wheezing, vampire midget. <laughs> then I started stuttering in the seventh grade. And I'd say, my, 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 my name, n n n n teacher say, who's the first president? His name was w w w w w w w w w Lincoln. She said, correct. It was a Louisiana school. And so... <laughs> So I'm thinking, then I asked my pastor, how do you know if God's called you to preach? He said, there will be a burning desire that does not go away. You'll see someone preach, you'll finish their sermon. You'll come up with points, you'll be thinking sermons. There'll be a burning desire to do that the rest of your life. So at teen camp, pot of gold, I'm saying, I cannot talk, I stutter. But if you're calling me, here am I, I will go. God doesn't explain how it's all going to work out. You just respond. When I walked the aisle that night, there were 13 boys from our teen group that surrendered to preach. They lined them all up. The girls came by. They hugged their necks. Oh, we knew God was calling you. We knew God was. The way they get hugged by the pretty girls, surrender to preach. The next night, surrender to the mission field. Next night, be an evangelist like Brother Caleb. The next night, be a... a I was standing in line. True story. They didn't know I surrendered. They thought I was just waiting on my buddies. It's okay. He knew. And I don't know what hard thing God's talking to you about tonight. Maybe it's surrendering to ministry. Maybe it's coming clean about something. Maybe it's giving it all to the Lord, surrendering it all. You'll be respected one day. You'll be respected. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings upon this time.